We are here at the Osawatomie State Hospital Memorial Cemetery. And this cemetery was for patients who weren't claimed after death. So this is kind of a pauper cemetery. And according to Find a Grave, there are 1,776 internments here, but there are only 346 that are marked. And the ones that are marked are only marked with a number. No name, no date of birth, no date of death, just a number. And that's kind of sad. The state hospital was a mental health hospital and it was opened in the 1860s and it continues to this day. The cemetery was in use from 1871 to 1959. Back then it was called the Kansas State Insane Asylum and people were labeled as insane and as lunatics. And that's not politically correct anymore, but you are going to hear me use the phrase insane asylum. And that's because when these people were in the hospital, it was called an insane asylum. I mean, no disrespect. And we are going to visit the infirmary at the state hospital after the cemetery. And I've added chapters so you can jump to that if you want to. My goal today is to recognize a few of these individuals and give them their names back. And they're all numbered from 1 to 346. So let's go check out grave number 1. So thank goodness for find a grave because that's where I got all of my information. And this guy right here in this grave is Charles Vanderlip. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1859 and he died in February of 1928. And he was 68 years old and has the distinction of being the very first grave with a marker. All right, we are looking for grave number 22. And that is it right there. And that is Louis Parasot. And he was born in 1872 and he died on December 3rd, 1928. He was 56 years old. And I did find a newspaper article on him. And it says, Louis Parasot, who was dismissed from the insane asylum about two months ago, has been growing worse again, and Sheriff Vincent was telephoned yesterday to take him in charge again. Mr. Perrot's case is a sad one, and his fathers and brothers have the sympathy of all in their distress. He will be returned to the asylum until he is entirely cured of the mental trouble. And supposedly he was judged insane because of political study, and he was a candidate for the district clerk on the socialist ticket. So, I guess you could, back in the 20s, get yourself put into an insane asylum if you had some differing political beliefs. If you're new here, my name is Julian Gower, and I go to historical sites and attractions in the Kansas, Missouri area. And I do that every week, and I take you with me. And today, we are at a seriously cool cemetery. Number 25 there is Homer Clarence Austin. He was born on July 29, 1852 in Vermont, and he died December 23rd, 1928 at the age of 76. And we're very lucky we have a photograph of him. Okay. There's also a lot of older people in their 70s and 80s that are buried here. And that was probably because they went senile or they were, they were just old and there was nowhere else to go. There was no one to take care of them. And they probably didn't have the money to take care of themselves. Probably couldn't take care of themselves. So they had their only opportunity to go either to the poorhouse or to the insane asylum. And unfortunately, in the 30s, during the Depression, the poorhouse was so packed that they did have to take people up to the insane asylum to live just so they could house these people. And a lot of them died. There's a lot of these graves right here that we're looking at that are from the 30s a lot and I'm thinking that those unmarked graves are probably right over here in this field or possibly back there because there's nothing here absolutely nothing wow it's windy now that one is broken. That is number 34. And that is Edward Kane. 
and he was born in 1856 and he died February of 1929 at the age of 63. Huh, that's sad. Let's go take a look at that though and see how it was made. Hmm. Can you see that? Oops. Yeah, that's broken. You know, I really do feel bad for these people because they died and nobody claimed them. Or they were just so indigent that they didn't have the money to be buried in a proper cemetery. So they're thrown in this cemetery with no name and no date of birth. I'm just finding it incredibly sad. All right, there's number 52 right there. 52, I believe that this is the youngest person in the cemetery, or at least the youngest I could find. This is Bonnie Culver, and she died August of 1929. She was 29 years old. And this one right here, number 60, that's Hiram Briggs. And he's got a tree that has grown up right there. How cool is that? He died in February of 1930. He was 80 years old. Okay, so what would get you thrown into the insane asylum here in Osawatomie? And it's Osawatomie, not Osawatomie. I've been saying it wrong and I got corrected by two viewers. I'm sorry. I really do try to pronounce things properly. So it's Osawatomie. So what is something that could get you thrown into a mental institution at the turn of the century in the 1920s and the 1930s? Well, epilepsy, that was a big one. I read that a lot. A lot of these people had epilepsy. And then of course there were the people who had dementia, people who were just old. There were ladies here who had postpartum depression. I even read about a guy who had a brain injury. He worked for the railroad and he fell, hurt himself, and they sent him to the insane asylum. I mean, the man had a brain injury. He wasn't, he wasn't mentally deficient. He didn't have a mental illness, but at that time they didn't know where else to send him. So they sent him to the insane asylum. Okay, here's 90. I found this guy kind of interesting. This guy is named Gerhard Vindemir, and he was born in 1867 in Germany. He arrived in the United States in 1886 via New York. And in 1918, he had to fill out a registration affidavit of an alien enemy. And in that, he reports that his brother Herman is in the German army and is an enemy of the United States, but that he isn't. Very interesting stuff. And he died December 13th, 1930, and he was 63 years old. If we go down here, we're gonna find Bertha. Bertha is number 98. There's Bertha right there. Okay, so there's Bertha. And I found an interesting article about Bertha. It says, Miss Bertha Parse made an interesting lecture on Tuesday, May the 11th at the new gymnasium. She spoke from experience on the organized operations of invisible evil beings. This speech was unusual and aroused several students and teachers. And she died March of 1931, and she was 62 years old. We are now looking for 118, which is nothing but a tree. So we have 117, and then over here we have 119, and then there, that is where... Emma Hartman is buried, and uh, she was born in 1851, and she died in October of 1931. You know, I guess if I was going to be here in an unmarked grave like this, I'd want a tree. I would, I would absolutely want a tree. And not all the stones are unmarked. So someone had family members who came in and put this down in memory of Granny, Minnie M. Divine, January 11th, 1875 to October 23rd, 1933. 
So not all of these people were forgotten. And there's another one right over here. Let's go check it out. Okay, so that's Clyde Nelson, born December 27th, 1880, and he died November 30th, 1941. And he just has a different tombstone. I don't know. Oh, and somebody has carved up at the top. I don't know if you can see it. Father. Well, now that is one that is clearly marked and has not eroded very much, but that is 194. That is Sarah Hawkert Idings. She was born in 1839 in Indiana, and she died July 11th, 1935. She was 96 years old, and she was sent to the state asylum by court order in November of 1880, and she stayed there until her death. So she was in the hospital for 55 years. Wow. Hmm. All right, 200. 99, 200, right here at the end. Okay. This is Francis Theodore Ravencamp. Born 1887, died October 29th, 1935. 48 years old. And I think it's interesting how the carvings changed. I mean, that's just super crude. But then if you go up here to this one, that one is very neatly done. All right, so there's another one that's got a tree growing up, and it's actually incorporated around the tombstone. This is Harry O'Flanagan, and he was born in 1887, and he died July 1937, and he was 49 to 50 years old. And it really does look like that his tombstone is being eaten by a tree. And I really do wish that I could go over each and every one of these graves and tell you who they are, but that would be a two or three hour video. If you're interested, I have left a link in the description to find a grave and you can explore on your own. Okay, so we have seen who belongs to grave number one or marker number one. Let's go down and see who belongs to 346. So the last marker, and there it is. And that belongs to Johann Heinrich Witt. He was born in Germany in 1856, and he died April of 1907. So I'm not really sure why his is the last grave, because 1943, that is William Henry Davis, and he died in October of 1959. So I'm not sure about that, if that is really who it is, but that is who Find a Grave says is in that plot. Now, I should have already known that this cemetery was here. I just happened to be driving past it and I saw it and I was shocked that I, I didn't know that this place was here. We have already been to Asylum Bridge, which is just right down the road. That is a bridge that goes over the Maurice de Seine River and it connects the town of Osawatomie to the State Mental Hospital. And at the end of that video, we got to see a little bit of the infirmary. And that is where I believe that the majority of the people in this cemetery spent their last nights. And at the end of that video, we got a teeny, teeny, tiny snippet of that infirmary. And I was too scared to get too close or to go around the building. Not today, no, no. I am not scared today. I am going to go up to the building. I'm going to go around the building. I'm going to see if there's any open windows that we can peer in and look at. And we're going to go see part of this state mental hospital. So let's go check that out. So this is the infirmary here at the Osawatomie State Hospital. And I imagine that many of the people that are buried in that cemetery with all the unmarked graves spent their last days here and that's kind of sad and this building is kind of sad it's just falling down and i've already done a video kind of on this it was about asylum bridge and then we came here and looked at this and i had a viewer reach out and say 
that this is now used I think it's either the Osawatomi Fire Department or the Miami County Fire Department. I'll find out and put that below. But they use this now for training. And I believe that they're about ready to tear this sucker down. Let's just get a little closer. We're not going to go in because, one, it's off limits. And, two, it's probably pretty dangerous. So let's just go check it out. Wow, look at that. How pretty is this building? So this is called the Dijon building and it was built in 1901 and it cost $50,000 to build. Huh, okay, I'm just, just this one window. Uh, just an incredible building. I read that by 1912 that this hospital could serve more than a thousand patients, but I bet there were more than that. Everything I've read about this place, it says the same thing, that the conditions were deplorable and that the care was primitive and the patients were treated like prisoners. They were locked into their rooms or their cells at night. And I did find a few photographs of the interior. So we're headed around the south side of the building to see what is over there. And I'm not really sure what that is. Oh, it's a little garden seating area. That's cute. Wow. Kind of hard to see because all the trees, but. Yeah. And again, we're not going to go in because it's off limits and I just kind of have to respect that. I would love to go inside this building and see how it's laid out. It is incredibly peaceful on these grounds. I mean, it is, it's a beautiful day and it is just incredibly peaceful here. Uh, that wing to the left, it looks like it was an addition. Those bricks look different but I'm not really sure when that addition was put on. Wow, look at this. And some of the treatments that these patients suffered up here were lobotomies and cold water immersion, insulin comas, straight jackets, and of course, electroshock therapy. Wow, I really had no idea how big this place was. Oh my goodness, there is another wing. There are three huge wings here. Wow, that is cool. So this was not the only mental hospital in the state of Kansas. There was also the Topeka State Hospital and the Learned State Hospital. There was also a state hospital in Parsons and a state orphan's home in Atchison and a state training school in Winfield, and a sanatorium for tuberculosis in Norton. And they were all overcrowded. Okay, so this is the north side of the building, and it's identical to the south side with that really cool enclosed porch huh. on the second floor. This place is huge. And also, if you're enjoying our adventure today, please consider hitting the like button because it does help out my little bitty channel with the algorithm, and I do appreciate it very much. And I did find another window to look through, and I'm hoping I'm getting a good shot because I can't see. I'm having to stand on my tippy toes. Well, thanks for joining me today, and I do hope that you enjoyed this week's video, and I will see you all next week for another adventure. Bye now.